Early on the morning of the 20th of November 1979, even before the light of dawn had broken, some 50,000 pilgrims from around the world had gathered at the sacred Kaaba in the city of Mecca for prayers. A small group of men arrived in the courtyard with coffins, a traditional act of seeking blessings for those who have passed. Led by a preacher called Juheiman al Otaibi, the men seemed to be just like other pilgrims. But when they opened the coffins, there were automatic weapons and grenades inside. Khalid al Yami, one of the men and a professional preacher, announced, Fellow Muslims, behold today the coming of the Mahdi, who shall reign with justice and fairness on earth after it has been filled with injustice and oppression. Alyami spoke of his countless visions about the coming of the Mahdi. For the pilgrims, this was an extraordinary announcement. In the Hadith, the reports of what the Prophet Muhammad said or approved, the coming of the Mahdi or the divinely guided one is foretold. He is described as a man endowed with extraordinary powers by God. And some Muslims believe he will usher in an era of justice and true belief. Then there were shots. I am Praveen Swami, contributing editor at The Print. Welcome to this episode of Explorer. Following the last episode on Israel, some viewers wrote in asking us to take a close look at that other piece of the Middle East puzzle, Saudi Arabia. Long known for religious fanaticism, the oppression of women, the crushing of dissidents, Saudi Arabia is undergoing dramatic change. We are recording this episode of Explorer in a Week, where mixed martial arts fighter Hatan Al Saif has become the first Saudi woman to sign on with the Professional Fighters League. We are recording in a week when the Women's Tennis Association's finals, it's been announced, will be held in Saudi. Heck, late last month, Saudi Arabia was even reported to have opened a bar in Riyadh. Serving only diplomats, it's true, but a bar nonetheless. Look in the malls at the clothes women are wearing, at who's driving cars, you'll see change. The Al Ula region with its majestic rock home tomb, tombs at Maidan Saleh is even being set up to display pre-Islamic history to millions of tourists. How will all this play out? The question needs to be asked, because all this almost happened once before. King Faisal, who took the throne in 1964, brought about remarkable modernization. First cars arrived, electrical goods became commonplace, the country urbanized, and in some regions, men and women had even begun to mix in public. And then it all unraveled horribly. Will the same thing happen again? Or is Saudi Arabia now headed down a path from which there is no turning. To answer that question, we need to begin by taking a look at the storm that rose from the desert. In the mid-1960s, a group called Al Jama Al Salafiyah was formed by a small group of religious students who for some time had been proselytizing in Medina's poorer neighborhoods. They were driven by a general conviction that mainstream religious schools and tendencies in the Muslim world were betraying the religion. They saw the official Wahhabism of the Saudi religious establishment in the same poor light. They were also acting to counter the influence of other groups on the religious scene in the late 1960s and early 1970s, like the Jamaat al-Tabligh, the proselytizing group that arose from India in the last century, but also the Muslim Brotherhood which had arisen in Egypt. Both of these groups propagated a purified kind of Islam and provided an alternative to existing forms of Islamic activism. They were shared by some of the most prominent religious scholars in Medina at the time, like Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz and Abu Bakr al-Jazairi. The founding members of the Jamaat al Salafiya made contact with these scholars and considered Sheikh Ibn Baz as their leader. The formation of the Jamaat al-Salfiyah 
was promoted by an episode known among its members as the breaking of the pictures. Around 1965, this group's students had begun to consider it their duty to enforce religious obligations and regulations in certain parts of Medina. Enforce obligations in their understanding meant to destroy pictures and photographs that were put up in public spaces. There was friction, even clashes in Medina between these zealous conservatives and local residents. The government more or less ignored this kind of activism until a group of young activists were caught smashing a large number of display windows showing female mannequins in the center of Medina. And yes, back then there were female mannequins. Having inflicted serious damage on commercial property, the perpetrators were identified, imprisoned for approximately a week. But confrontation with the police fired up these activists and led them to coordinate their efforts. Not long after this, the Al Jama Al Salfiya was born. As the group's activities stepped up in intensity, they attracted an ever larger number of followers. In the 1970s, they set themselves up in a purpose-built two-storey building in the poor neighbourhood of Al Hara Al Sharqiya in Medina, an area known for the conservatism of its residents. By 1976, there were branches in all major Saudi cities. The new group actually distinguished itself in terms of its rituals from the bulk of believing Muslims. They insisted that the condition for breaking the, f f the fast during Ramzan was not the setting of the sun but the disappearance of the light. And hence Ramzan the fast could be broken in a room with closed windows. They considered it permissible to pray wearing sandals which caused a certain amount of scandal with fellow worshippers in the Prophet's mosque in Medina. And unlike other mosques, the mosque used by the Al Jama Al Salafiyah had no Mirdib or niche because the group considered this a forbidden innovation, something that they call Bida. These unorthodox practices worried scholars in Medina who had been initially sympathetic to the group. Sheikh Mukib al Wadi, one of the JSM sheikhs, recalls being summoned by two senior Medina based scholars who questioned him on 12 issues which they deemed problematic. The relationship between the conservative scholars and the members of Al Jama Al Salfiya reached breaking point in 1977. There was a meeting between them on the roof of their office during which there was a clash. The path to a crisis was now irrevocably set. The clash propelled Johiman bin Muhammad Al Saif Al Utaibi to center stage in these events. We know little about this man who was to be so important to Saudi Arabia's destiny. Al Utaibi was born in the 1930s to a Bedouin family in the settlement of Sajir in the western part of Najd province. Juhayman's family belonged to the Sukur branch of the large Utaiba tribe. The young Utaiba, we know, was raised in a very traditional Bedouin environment. His grandfather, Saif al Dham, was a horseman who had participated widely in Bedouin raids on settled areas of the kingdom before it became a modern or centralized state under King Abdulaziz. Juhayman's father, Muhammad bin Saif, was believed to have fought alongside the rebel leader Sultan bin Bajad in a rebellion in 1927 and survived the Battle of Sibla where the rebels were crushed. Juhayman was proud of his father's exploits and keen to evoke the memory of the old Ikhwan rebels and their comrades. We also know Juhayman was not very educated. He left school early on, having probably only received a fourth grade education formally. There were widespread rumours that he was illiterate, but they don't seem to have been completely true. However, we know Jehman's classical Arabic was quite poor, was coloured by Bedouin dialect and that he avoided writing, maybe because he was dyslexic. Jehman's had spent the bulk of his working life in Saudi Arabia's elite National Guard. He probably joined in 1955 and left in late 1973. 
Some say he served with honor, others that he was dismissed in humiliating circumstances. We are not sure, but what we do know is that after he left the National Guard, he moved to Medina. Lacking formal school qualifications, Johima never enrolled at university. However, he did attend classes for a short time at the Dar al Hadith, an institution in Medina which taught uh, clerical literature, which is affiliated with the University of Medina. Following the clash on the rooftop in which he played such an important role, he fled the city to avoid arrest and lived a peripatetic existence in the desert. However, his letters were published by the leftist Kuwaiti newspaper Altalia, the vanguard, whose owners were sympathetic to what they saw as a kind of working class uprising brewing in Saudi Arabia's Hejaz. Johaiman's pamphlets used to be printed and published across Saudi Arabia. Then, using weapons smuggled from Yemen, came the clash outside the Kaaba. Saudi Arabian authorities eventually regained control of the sanctuary, with the assistance of three French Special Forces officers led by Captain Paul Barry. The rebels were tried and sentenced with lightning speed. At around dawn, on the 9th of January 1980, 63 people were executed in eight different cities. The convicts included Saudi nationals, 41 of them, but also 10 Egyptians, 6 South Yemenis, 3 Kuwaitis, a North Yemeni, an Iraqi and a Sudanese national. The story of the Saudi recapture of the mosque is in itself a fascinating one. Following the failure of their own forces to capture the mosque, the local forces were mowed down by snipers among the rebels. The Saudi authorities had contacted the French intelligence chief, Giscard d'Estaing. Finally, they drilled holes into the basement below the Grand Mosque and dropped special gas canisters to flush out the rebels. Eventually, the mosque was captured, but not without many scandals. In his memoirs, Captain Estaing, I'll repeat that, sorry. In his memoirs, Captain Barrel said that he'd actually visited Mecca during uh, the crisis, the other two officers, perhaps in an effort to calm down the waters, denied that this had happened. But the capture of the mosque left the Saudi establishment extremely disoriented and shocked. And it was because the kingdom was coming under siege. You see, the crisis at the Grand Mosque wasn't the only crisis that threatened to overwhelm the kingdom in 1979. Of course, revolution had broken out in Iran, just across the straits. The Iranian revolution threatened Saudi Arabia's primacy across the Islamic world. The oil industry, moreover, in Saudi Arabia was based in Shia territory, and the Shia made up much of the country's semi-skilled and unskilled labor. The oil industry, unfortunately, had not led to better economic, educational or social opportunities for the Shia population. They were banned from certain professions, for example the army and from educational institutions, and were prohibited from performing special Ashura mourning rituals, a key part of their faith. King Faisal's Wahhabi ulama had even issued fatwas condemning the Shia. Some ulama went so far as to declare that meat slaughtered by Shias was unfit for consumption by other Muslims. The Iranian revolution in 1979 turned many Shia inside Saudi Arabia into rebels. The Shia took to the streets in the Ashura season that year when they usually mourned the death of their martyrs, Hussein and Hassan, a practice forbidden by the state. Then in 1980, Shia organized large demonstrations and a series of strikes in Katif to celebrate the first anniversary of the return of Ayatollah Rolla Khomeini from exile to Iran to lead the revolution. This celebration became an occasion to voice their discontent over their status as second-class citizens of Saudi Arabia. The National Guard eventually crushed the demonstrations, killing several participants, but it left deep scars. In 1982, soon afterwards, when King Fahad took over Saudi Arabia, 
an economic crisis also kicked in. Fahad's earliest years as king coincided with a sharp decrease in oil prices. The oil price dropped from $32 a barrel to $15 a barrel in early 1980, reducing Saudi oil revenues by over 30%. Within six months between January and July 1986, oil prices dropped from $26 a barrel to just $8 a barrel. The kingdom's economy was gutted and many prestige development projects simply ground to a halt. Saudi Arabia eventually survived the crisis and continued threats to its existence like the so-called Arab Spring. And there are three reasons for this. The first is money. In 2011, as the Arab Spring raged across the rest of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia was able to commit $130 billion to the development of its citizens. The biggest commitment was to housing, which accounted for over half the spend, with a promise to build 500,000 homes over the next several years, and to vastly increase the availability of state loans for private home purchases. There were also immediate payouts, a one-time bonus equivalent to two months' salary for all government employees, military personnel, and retirees from the largest private sector employers. There was the introduction of unemployment benefits, an increase in the minimum wage, and a continuation of an inflation allowance for state salaries. The kingdom also created more than 60,000 public sector jobs to meet the demands of young Saudis. And of course, there's a very young population. The second reason for the relative stability for Saudi Arabia in a season of Arab uprisings was the political reliability and deployment of its security services. The most important security services, that is the police, the secret police, the special forces of the military of interior and the national guard, were directly commanded by the king and later by his sons. These forces were recruited disproportionately from tribes and areas the kingdom sees as particularly loyal. Now, the Saudi security forces were not always such pillars of the regime. Air Force pilots famously defected in 1962 when they were called on to support the monarchical regime in North Yemen against an Egyptian-backed coup. Saudi Arabia also had its share of fa failed coup attempts, the most serious of them in 1969. But the Saudi rulers found a happy medium of coexistence with their security infrastructure. The third element that protected the Saudi monarchy were its deep client networks. The Saudi political system is built on patronage flowing from the top, from the king, to various tribes, clans and individual families of influence, as well as institutions like the religious establishment, the media and various sporting clubs. Many benefits that now flow to Saudi individuals are processed in a very bureaucratic way. You don't need to directly intercede with the king uh, to ask for help and support as one may have done many decades ago. But the fact of the matter is the ruling Al Saud family still maintains its personal networks of patronage and communication, dispensing access to government and personal favours to their clients. That's how they survived the Arab Spring and the many crises before it, including the crisis of 1979. But the Saudi regime also began to understand that there was a fundamental problem with the model it set in place. In a young, restive country, there was no way to meet the aspirations of the population without big reforms that modernized the country and led to the creation of entrepreneurship. You see, oil, while it is a source of wealth, can also be a curse. If you can make money easily from simply extracting oil from the ground, you have very few incentives to take the risks that come with entrepreneurship and running businesses. The king realized that you can't keep on digging wealth from the ground and hope to unleash or harvest the productive energies of your population. Something new had to be done. 
Well, that's something new we're seeing. There are big flashy developments, $48 billion in property developments anchored by a quarter mile tall cube that's supposed to come up, a global airline that's to rival aviation giants across the world. There's been a merger with the PGA tennis store, a $100 billion new city that's meant to be a hub of artificial intelligence and robotics. In 2017-2019, the new crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, purge the kingdom of what might be called Saudi oligarchs or sort of hangers on of the royal family um, and destroyed their power um, which had leached off the kingdom. Mohammed bin Salman's got an amazing collection of friends despite his atrocious human rights record which includes the execution of dissident Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey. Uh, the film star Johnny Depp is one of his closest uh, friends and so is Jared Kushner, son-in-law to former President Donald Trump. In a 2018 interview, Mohammed bin Salman famously said he wanted women to have equality and for Saudi Arabia to go back to being the kind of normal country it was before the events at Mecca in 1979. But this hasn't meant that Saudi Arabia, of course, has gone the direction down the rule of law or has got genuine equality for women who don't like the status quo. Uh, just a few days ago, Manahil al Otebi, uh, a, a, a physical fitness instructor, was detained for posting Snapchat selfies without an abaya and for calling for the removal of repressive male guardianship laws, which give uh, family uh, male relatives control of women's lives. Um, and, and this goes to the heart of some of the dysfunctions in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in March 2022, Saudi Arabia made some tentative movement towards what it marketed uh, as giving full equality to women. It amended its personal status law. Um, and this was you know, claimed by the crown prince to be a leap towards women's uh, empowerment. But if you look carefully at the law, you will see that it actually perpetuates the male guardianship system and codifies discrimination against women in most aspects of uh, family life. In fact, you have had a string of young uh, Saudi women uh, seeking asylum in countries uh, in the Far East and even in Turkey, in the West, in Canada, uh, because they believe that there is no hope of genuine equality under, uh, in the kingdom even though there are all these gestures towards you know, uh, freeing up dress codes, uh, allowing women to drive and so on. Uh, things aren't good if you don't happen to agree with uh, the ruling family either. Uh, Amnesty International has documented some cases of 69 individuals who have been prosecuted and harshly punished over just the last decade uh, for demanding the right to freedom of expression, association or peaceful assembly. And many of these have been, individuals have been prosecuted under counter-terrorism law or anti-cyber crime laws, even though there is nothing to suggest they were fomenting violent unrest. Uh, most of these cases are simply for expressing peacefully uh, opinions uh, on social media and the real number of these prosecutions is probably far higher than we have seen in these uh, uh, protests. Uh, to give you a sample of how Saudi courts still function in Manahil al Otaibi, the physical fitness uh, instructor's prosecution. Um, uh, the public prosecutor noted that her sister Fawzia al Otaibi, who is uh, based in London, I quote, leads a propaganda campaign to incite Saudi girls to denounce religious principles and rebel against customs and traditions in Saudi culture. Um, and uh, 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 according to the prosecutor, this uh, uh, social media campaign uh, did the great crime of, uh, I quote, promoting liberation and the fall of male guardianship. Um, now, the amazing, so, so basically, um, uh, while Saudi Arabia is uh, sort of putting up this face of liberal reform, bringing about deep changes, it's also extremely reluctant to actually bring de deep reform. And that suggests fear. The fear isn't unfounded. The revolution in Iran in 1979, the Islamic uh, revolution, happened when investments uh, the monarchy there had made uh, didn't bring about the kind of investments, the uh, kind of returns, excuse me, that would have brought about a genuine uh, change in the economy. Kingdom's fears of bringing about real substantial change aren't without foundation. 
the revolution in Iran in 1979 happened when uh, the Iranian monarchy's efforts to bring about political uh, to to bring about political reform uh, floundered when uh, it, uh, when its when its bedrock economic transformation failed to come about. Uh, people angry with inequality and with the lack of economic opportunity in Iran, uh, the result of a sudden collapse in oil prices, uh, eventually rebelled against the state. Uh, the tragic consequences of that were to be a tightening um, of uh, restrictions uh, on women and big changes uh, in reversing uh, the monarchy's relatively liberal social policies. Um, it, Saudi Arabia fears there could be a backlash of this kind as well and doesn't want to move too quickly on opening up uh, uh, things. Um, as I said, King Faisal's uh, uh, policies uh, were quickly reversed after 1979 and King Khalid brought about a period of tightening uh, of restrictions, uh, tightening of social codes and strengthening of the clergy uh, to bring about a kind of big change uh, in the social fabric and, and restrict society so that conservatives uh, would be happy. Saudi Arabia has also seen deep challenges from Islamist movements despite its efforts to project itself as the fortress of piety. Uh, even though the 1979 rebellion was crushed, you have had various iterations of Islamism afterwards. Uh, there's been the Sehwa movement among Saudi Arabia's elite who've tried to use Islam and orthodoxy as a weapon to push back against the power of the monarchy, accusing the monarchy of being profligate and not concerned enough with the lives of uh, ordinary Saudis. And there's been a yet another current, of course, in the form of uh, uh, Osama bin Laden, most famously, and Al-Qaeda, uh, whose violent terrorist operations uh, killed, claimed the lives of hundreds of Saudis and foreigners in the kingdom. That terrorist threat is alive just across the border in Yemen. Saudi Arabia's efforts to crush Al-Qaeda in Yemen, where it shelters under the umbrella of the Houthi uh, tribal rebellion, have mostly failed and could emerge as a threat again in the future. Um, the 1979 story then is critically important because it tells us uh, that reform, liberalization and opening up aren't a one-way street. History doesn't mark, mark just in uh, one direction and they can be sharp reverses. It's a matter of particular concern because of course since the war in Gaza began, which our last episode was on, um, it's far from clear um, what the fallout across the Arab world will be. Many, many uh, Arabs seem very, very angry about what is happening in Gaza, even if their governments uh, or kings and rulers have been reluctant to involve themselves directly on the side of the Palestinians. And this anger could conceivably empower jihadist movements that seek to dismantle Arab states as well. We'll just have to wait and see. Thank you for watching this episode of Explorer and I hope you'll join us again next week.